morning. My name is Justin Rajadiaksha. I'm Alec Lexis. I'm Ben Carpenter. I'm Andrew McNulty. Tim Duray. And I'm Rex Holmes. We're here today as East Coast Consultants to present to you three design solutions that we have uh, designed to benefit us today in the present while maintaining uh, consideration for the future generations. I'd like to first take a moment to have you picture something in your mind. I think of a turn of the century colonial style home found on the East Coast. Now consider a 1970s style uh, ranch home and consider what, what the value is today. Our building solution, or our sustainability solution, excuse me, the eternal building represents the reuse of building materials from existing homes and repurposing them into new homes. We as construction individuals understand that buildings have a finite lifespan and use. However, while the, while the buildings themselves have a finite lifespan, the materials have an infinite lifespan. It's just a matter of how they are utilized and uh, taken care of over the course of the future. The idea of the eternal building is to repurpose existing materials by deconstruction and reusing them into new construction. And finally, our goal here is to link to the, find a link to the past through a vision of the future. Sustainable construction has been used throughout the centuries. But in the recent decades, we've seen a decline in three major um, sustainable materials that we see. As we see it, uh, the three sustainable materials are timber, stone, and ceramics. Um, these materials, while they don't have a, um, a structural component to them, their material aspect can be used over the course of a lifetime. So we'd like for you to take this chart, for example. Consider each pie section of the chart as a building lifetime. Now, the white lines that separate the sections of the chart can represent any number of things that cause the building lifetime to end. You could have structural failure. You could have the end of the use of a building. That's so what you do is you collect the materials through a deconstruction process, which slows down your demolition phase at the end of a building lifetime, and then repurpose them into a new building. So for instance, you would go in, collect the stone facade off a building or a brick exterior. And this, yes, is going to take a little bit more time, but you have decreased costs when you're going to reapply that to a new building. Now we realize it's hard to look at this at first, first sight and say this is going to work for the future. But as we see it, there are three ways um, that, that this will sustainably impact um, our lives as we know it. It's through the environment and through the economy. Last year, the EPA alone estimated that one billion board feet were lost <coughs> due to reconstruction, or due to demolition, excuse me. One of the major reasons why we think that there's so much material lost it's due to the fact that there isn't a marketplace existing for people to sell the materials once they're out or once they're doing demolition. So through the implementation and creation of a marketplace that allows homeowners to post when they're going to demolish their buildings, what their buildings are going to or what their buildings are produced of, and then sell those to different individuals, we think that we can increase the reusability of existing materials. Now the environment alone, uh, we see that these two um, factors are related: the carbon footprint and the reuse of building materials over a lifetime. Um, by reusing materials, instead of harvesting new materials from, from, from the earth, we're able to prolong a specific material and use it for the future. Uh, just the cement industry alone last year accounted for 5% of the world's global CO2 emissions. So you can kind of see a trend as to how, where would we, we would like to see um, the world go. The other major benefit of the eternal building is the economical one. You not only have an increased value of home when you're reaching the end of a building lifetime, but you also have a decreased cost of materials at the beginning of a building. So you're seeing it on both ends of construction. Now the mantra of the eternal building is going from deconstruction to reconstruction. It allows us to breathe life into new buildings through existing building materials. And finally, um, what we'd like to see here is to create a sustainable housing future. No, not one that's dependent on just um, the, the resources that we might have in the future, but the resources that we have from the past. There's a lot of untapped uh, materials out there that we can use um, for the future. Now I'd like to talk about developmental expansion and phasing. It is very important to design a building today that has multiple purposes, not just one purpose. As you can see, 5.8% of the buildings in Detroit are abandoned <coughs> today. 2,488 vacant homes in Indianapolis. Millions of dollars right now are being lost to abandoned buildings buildings. As you can see in the past, we built buildings for one purpose and one purpose only, and after that they sat abandoned. Uh, it's unattractive to cities. Um, it 
discourages future construction. But now I'd like to talk about some of the pros. It saves money. It saves maintenance bills. Um, buildings aren't just being used for one purpose. They bring communities get together and promotes physical activities amongst the society and brings them together as one. Along with having multiple purposes for one building, you can put, you can bring together the community and promote social welfare. If you're able to live and work in the same structure, well, you can have a de decreased carbon footprint by not having to commute to other places around the city or the state. Overall, that leaves a smaller carbon footprint. Now, through the Milpit Station developmental expansion and phasing, we see that you can easily expand and add additions to this structure in the future. One of the ways this was done was through the ex excessive excavation um, in the trench where they were thinking about the future when it came to the rail lines and saw that in the future we're going to have more um, traffic through this station and that they would easily be able to expand through these additional rail lines without having to pay the inflated cost of construction in the future. This saves taxpayer money. Since this is a federally funded project, um, you're going to save many thousands, millions of dollars in construction costs. Along, this informs the public about the green construction of the building and it reduces your carbon footprint by using a mode of transportation that is becoming increasingly efficient in this day and age through the rail. We see that m through multiple uses of the building in the future you can live, work, and use this building as a mode of transportation in a big central city. <coughs> A living building. The idea behind this is to take a typical building and provide it with the capabilities to, for interaction far beyond that of normal system controls. So through a network of sensors that are installed throughout the building, it would provide the users with the ability to monitor factors such as building health, uh, interaction with its environment, and interaction with its people. The interaction of these sensors creates a vast amount of opportunities for typical buildings. For instance, it can track the movement of people throughout the building, so you have an understanding of the vibrations through the floors, the beams, the columns. This allows systems such as your HVAC system to have an understanding of where people are located within your building, so that you're not conditioning the entire building, but portions of your building, so you're saving yourself both cost and energy. Additionally, security. If there is a certain amount of load within your building and it's reaching the max capacity, this building can inform the user that there is too much load in one area and that the load needs to be removed before failure is reached. And if failure is reached, the building will understand its integrity and its structural strengths, and will guide people safely out of the building through its most structurally sound direction. And this can be used through like a lighting direction, like an airplane, guiding you out the correct direction. And it can be used for fire security as well. Building analysis. This building has an interaction with its environment. It has an understanding of its geography. It can study its live loads. It knows wind loads, rain loads, snow loads, earthquake loads. And for instance, San Francisco. You want to study this building and its geographical um, interaction with its environment. You can take what you analyze in this building and make improvements to future buildings to make it more sustainable in the future. Building health. You're able to analyze the health of the building. For instance, there's a pressure drop in a room. You're able to have an understanding of this pressure drop because the sensors can detect it. You can then make that improvement. It will let you know that there's a pressure drop and that you need to make this change because you have to condition the building more to meet the demand of the pressure. Additionally, maintenance schedules. There's the routine maintenance schedule that you have maybe like month by month, but also gives you an understanding that if the HVAC system or electrical system are not performing to its needs, it'll make you aware of that and that it needs to make that maintenance now rather than later to save you cost as well as energy. And academics. These, these sensors are not only tied together, but they're tied together and tapped to a network. You can access these sensors from anywhere around the world. Germany, for instance. You could have researchers in Germany tap into this system and get an understanding of how this building is interacting with its environment so you can make improvements to your buildings in the future. And not only can researchers benefit from this, but students can benefit from this as well in the classroom, understanding how the loads interact within the building. Thank you for your time today. We appreciate the opportunity to present to you our ideas on sustainable solutions. We open the floor for questions. You guys talked a lot about, <clears throat> excuse me, you guys talked a lot about um, deconstruction, deconstruction and reuse of materials. <coughs> How can you ensure that as an owner I get a quality product to install and reuse the materials? Well, I think that it's important to look at how the building is construct constructed from the beginning. You know, if you look at uh, just this table here, 
it, it folds down and comes back up almost um, you know in, in seconds, and the, and the curtain around it is unsnapped and and moved um, in seconds as well. So if you think about how the construction is from the beginning, we can then um, figure out a way for the future to take uh, those parts off with little harm and uh, reuse them in as um, I guess almost their original value. I think that's one of the big reasons too that you bring up a good point as to why we're choosing the three big materials that we did, which are wood, ceramics, and um, aggregates or stone, because those don't necessarily degrade over time. So if you have a limestone facade, you're going to use that facade on a different building. As long as you like aesthetically, it's still going to be okay. If you have mahogany doors in a building and you like the look, or you like the look of them, then they'll be fine. But uh, we certainly wouldn't promote reutilizing materials that don't fit to the owner's need. Um, I found the online marketplace idea intriguing. Um, I'm wondering if that exists or if it doesn't exist. Um, can you maybe touch on what might some of the cons be? Why doesn't it exist? Why hasn't someone done it yet? What could be the difficulties of it? Um, well, I think I can feel that. Um, as far as, you know, if you look at the Living Building Challenge, I don't know if you're familiar with that at all, but uh, the way it works is that you uh, take materials and you figure out what their, their resource, their uh, components are within them. So if there's lead in it, then you can't use it in the project. The way it works with contractors is that you're allowed to uh, figure out what works for your project and then put it onto an online website. And so you see that, um, okay, so future, or previous projects have used uh, these products and they seem to work uh, with LBC. Um, I think the issue with um, doing something of that uh, magnitude, I guess, is that um, people aren't willing to um, go the extra mile up front. I mean, if you think about uh, where LEED was 10, 15 years ago, it was a lot to think about. And it took you know, somebody to get the ball rolling to get to that point. And also, when I think of this, I think almost as a meat or eBay type marketplace, but the major difference between the two being the quality control, as you brought up. So you have districts where you have individual quality control inspectors. So when someone posts something, they go and verify that the material is what they're saying it is, and that it can be reutilized. I like it. Keep that. That's a good idea. You guys talked a lot about um, adding, you know, a lot of sensors and stuff. Can you talk to me about um, the cost impacts of that and why I would want to invest in? So the upfront cost for these sensors, anywhere from five to five hundred to a thousand dollars, and you're probably going to need anywhere from hundred to two hundred sensors within your building. So you're looking at a hundred thousand to a hundred thousand dollar impact when putting this into your building. But the benefits you're going to have in the future for creating more sustainable buildings, based off the research you could have installing it on this building, are detrimental. So.